technology, the internet, GPS in the palm of your hand, autonomous operation. Technology is a driver of our times. Since its founding in 1958 in the midst of the Cold War, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, has been a driver of technology. Welcome to Voices from DARPA, a window onto one of the country's most consequential places and cultures of innovation. My name is Ivan Amato, and I'm your DARPA host. In this episode of Voices from DARPA, the future of modernity's most iconic technology, microelectronics. In February 1958, by decree of a Department of Defense directive, an innovation in the process of innovation itself was born. It was known as the Advanced Research Projects Agency. Within a year's time, two engineers, one at Texas Instruments in Dallas and one at Fairchild Semiconductor in what would later be known as Silicon Valley, independently implemented the world's first integrated circuit. The age of microelectronics was about to begin. Now, electronic chips are everywhere in our lives and the technologies that they enable have utterly transformed the world and how we live in it. Semiconductors are magical. That's John Neufer, Chief Operating Officer of the Semiconductor Industry Association, which furthers the interests of the $200 billion sector. The technology is so exotic and so sophisticated that for nearly everybody, what chips do is magic. It's magic for most people technologically, but it's also what chips do in our, it, for our lives. Um, just, just the astounding communications we have, the, the, the role chips play in, in healthcare solutions, in keeping us happy and healthy, and, and, and now with the pandemic, uh, helping us learn remotely, helping us work remotely. It's really, chips are really one of the most awesome innovations of mankind. But in recent years, several challenges have been converging that threaten to put some jarring breaks on the evolution of semiconductor technology and the microelectronics age. It's a set of challenges that poses risk for U.S. industry and national security because, like the rest of society, the technology-infused landscape of defense is thick with ships. That's why in 2017, DARPA's leaders and program managers in the agency's Microsystems Technology Office rolled out what, even by DARPA standards, is an ambitious and far-reaching research pursuit. It's called the Electronics Resurgence Initiative, ERI for short. It's a five-year, $1.5 billion portfolio of some 30 programs now involving many hundreds of researchers in laboratories throughout academe, industry, and government. Mark Rosker is the director of DARPA's Microsystems Technology Office. One way to understand what ERI is about, he says, is through the lens of one of the most foundational principles of the electronics world. Let's talk about Moore's Law because it really is hard to have a discussion about uh, microelectronics without talking about Moore's Law. Gordon Moore in 1965, I think it was, made a projection that said the number of transistors in a chip was going to double every year or would or had been doubling every year and would keep doubling for a, some period of time. And I think later on that got changed to 18 to 24 months. So there was some fine tuning of that argument. And of course, he didn't project how long that was going to be true for. He didn't actually talk about the technology uh, that was making that be true. But sure enough, that has been true ever since then and has been maintained for a very long period of time. But the fundamental drivers for Moore's Law are something called geometric scaling, uh, which means that I'm making transistors smaller and smaller all the time. (laughs) People have known for decades, literally decades, that this could not extend forever. The scaling part, in any case, couldn't extend forever because we get down to a point where you just reach atomic limits. You can't make things smaller and smaller because you've gotten down to essentially as small as as these structures can physically be. And there have been many, many other practical problems along the way, but we have more or less reached the point where these scaling limits are right in front of us. We can't do much better in terms of physical size uh, than we're doing now. The iPhone that I'm recording this conversation on is using a five nanometer process. Five nanometers is uh, tens of atoms. 
so I get down to much less than that, uh, and I know we can't progress uh, beyond that point. So people are in, inevitably want to continue. They have grown an appetite for electronics being better and better all the time. There's a general feeling that there'll be dissatisfaction if we one day raise the flag and say, well, this is as good as it gets. It won't be getting any better than this. When denizens of DARPA hear something like, we are reaching the end of the era in which Moore's law can describe the rate of progress of semiconductor technology, they hear a mandate that goes something like, if that's what you think, then what new ideas and capabilities do we need to develop to transcend those limitations? This is where the Electronics Resurgence Initiative comes in. Rosker points to four big intertwined trends that underlie the need for the initiative. One is that uh, electronics, microelectronics, uh, and I use that term broadly to include things like photonics and so forth, but microelectronics is just becoming increasingly important to our world. Uh, to the commercial world and to the defense world. As an example, people like to talk about the difference between a, a really exceptional jet fighter that the defense world might care about and a not so good one is primarily determined by the electronics and nothing else. So electronics becomes really, really important. The second big trend is driven by economies of scale, the number of places in which one actually manufactures electronics, the foundry as they're called, keeps going down. There used to be dozens, and with the passage of time, it's become smaller and smaller. And now we've reached the point that worldwide, you can easily count it on your fingers, on one hand, the number of state-of-the-art foundries that produce the finest node uh, silicon devices in the world. Uh, and the problem with that is not just that there are fewer and fewer of them. The problem is that many of these um, have moved offshore. Uh, so the United States has concern over where it's where this really important electronics is going to come from. The third thing is that there is increasing, and it, it, it goes with the foreign supply, there is this concern about hardware security. Just as there is in the software world, there's concern that in the hardware world, when you design and build and then distribute uh, a product in electronics, the thing that is fabricated may not be exactly what you thought it was. Uh, so there are other ways in which there, there are potential vulnerabilities uh, that happen anywhere from the design step through what we call sustainment, which means you have to live with the electronics you, you built sometimes for decades. So all of these concerns have increased with time. And then the fourth and final issue is as electronics becomes more important and as it becomes smaller and as there are more transistors and everything we, we depend on, the process of designing those circuits has gotten to be incredibly expensive. Uh, and so this is one of these problems that um, is built on success. As we make things better and better, we make them more and more complex, and that complexity is killing us from a cost standpoint. So how do you get around that? So these four things together are really the underpinnings of what drove DARPA to think about the um, existence of an effort, which eventually became called the Electronics Resurgence Initiative, to, to focus on these kinds of problems and see what we could, from a technology standpoint, what options we could build to help make improvements in these areas that I mentioned. Right around 2017 was uh, the initiation. By 2018, we were talking about ERI in a very planned way. In fact, the first funding from a government standpoint happened in, uh, dedicated funding happened in 2019. Uh, so here we are today, we proposed a five-year plan. Uh, so here we are today getting to be more than, well, definitely more than halfway through that plan, uh, more like 60, 70% of the way through the plan. 
All of these concerns have been simmering for many years, but it was the specific year of 2017 in which DARPA committed to taking on an R&D journey as huge as ERI. I asked Mark if there was a catalytic factor. He pointed to a report by PCAST, the President's Council of Advisors for Science and Technology, which is part of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. He said the report underscored the vulnerabilities he just mentioned. Many of these things uh, have been developing over years, decades even. The trend, for example, to fewer and fewer foundries, you can go back to the 80s and people were already concerned about that. But uh, there's a difference between saying we have 50 or 75 foundries and if we're not careful in 10 years that we might have only half as many versus saying, well, we're down to five and it looks like we're going to be down to three pretty soon. You know, there's a moment at which these things finally become aware to a broader community. And that PCAST report in 2017 was the defining moment for that, I think. So ERI, 30 plus programs in its portfolio, hundreds of scientists and engineers at work, a five-year time course now into its fourth year, a billion and a half dollar budget, and spoiler alert, serious talk now of an ERI 2.0. First things first though, what is the Electronics Resurgence Initiative, and just what is DARPA up to? There's way too much to tell in a short podcast, but there are a half dozen technology themes among ERI's acronym soup of 30-plus programs. Again, Mark Rosker. So a couple of these themes are about how do you process information? How do you compute? In particular, because we are very focused at DARPA and, and in MTO on what's called uh, edge applications. So things that are happening uh, maybe far, far away from a data center, uh, things that uh, are happening that a soldier, a dismount, might uh, hold, you know, electronics they might hold in their hand. These things are very important to us. So two of the areas are uh, increasing information processing density and efficiency. That means can I make computers that are more efficient, that process information and do it with much, much less power? Uh, that's really what we mean by efficiency. And then the second area has just grown spectacularly, even since 2017. That's making decisions at the edge faster. So think of that as being, how do you employ artificial intelligence to, to not just process information and do uh, computations, but to actually reach a decision about, about what to go do. Uh, but again, uh, not in the context of something that's going to where you're going to inquire at a data center miles and miles away, but you're going to have to make that decision locally. The other big group of programs, there are three of them that kind of I, I would cluster together, and they have to do with how do you do uh, microsystem integration? So how do you build electronics? This is really becoming important, and it's where some of the most exciting ideas in electronics are happening right now. The first of these three areas is about a complete change that's happening where we are going from two-dimensional uh, electronics to wafers, dyes, you know, integrated circuits that live on two dimensions to three dimensions. This is driven by the fact that uh, we're reaching limits having to do with interconnects and throughput and moving data from one silicon transistor to the next. And the only real way around that problem is to go from the two-dimensional world to a three-dimensional world where there are many, many more interconnects. Which kind of leads to the second area, which is, okay, and I mentioned this before, we have this tremendous problem with design. Uh, we have you know, circuits with billions uh, of transistors, literally billions of transistors. How do you design a circuit with billions of transistors? And if I make it three-dimensional, oh my God, that's going to make it even worse. So how are you going to deal with the new ways of doing electronics design? Uh, and then the third area, which may not be obvious as being part of this, but we think of it as part of it, is this other area that I talked about before, hardware security. If I design something and then I go build it, maybe I, maybe I assemble it in some fashion, I want to make sure that it does exactly what I designed it to do Nothing more, nothing less. So how do you do that? And how do you make sure that every stage of this process is secure? So those three areas are connected with microsystems integration. And there's one more area. 
we care about specific examples of microsystem applications that are emerging and there's probably no single one that's more important to us uh, right now as, as a country, I would argue, than the revolution that's going on in communications. You might say 5G, but DARPA tends to think about 6G and 7G, not changing necessarily the next wave of cell phone communications, but the wave after that, or even two after that. So all of these things are really, these six areas have been the focus of what we work on in ERI. Just the names of a few ERI programs, along with their sometimes whimsical acronyms, suggest the complexity of the task. Here's one. Technologies for mixed-mode, ultra-scaled, integrated circuits or T-music. That's a program that zeroes in on the challenges of designing and making chips that can receive, sense, modify, manage, and otherwise engage the wide range of sensor, command, control, and other electromagnetic signals without which military operations would not be possible. Here's another. Photonics and the Package for Extreme Scalability or the PIPES program. This one is all about integrating photonic components or signaling and data managing devices that use photons instead of electrons into microsystems to push performance gains beyond what's possible with electronic components alone. Here's another. This one's known as the Lifelong Learning Machines program. If successful, this program will deliver new artificial intelligence chip architectures and machine learning techniques that will underlie systems that can, like people, learn continuously and become increasingly expert while performing tasks such as driving cars and doing science. Here's one of my favorites, partly because its acronym, Sith, sounds like dark side villains of the Star Wars saga. Sith is short for System Security Integrated Through Hardware and Firmware. It's an ERI program that focuses on security and defense against hackers by developing new hardware architectures that are inherently immune to software-based attacks. Okay, let me mention just one more ERI program. This is called MIDAS, which stands for Millimeter Wave Digital Arrays. This one is all about arrays of electronic devices, teeny tiny antennas to be more specific, that can operate at super duper high frequencies. This is the sort of technology that is likely to become the basis of the 6G and 7th generation of communications devices that will follow the current new generation 5G. ERI is just the latest expression of DARPA's lifelong co-evolution with semiconductor science and technology. Semiconductor Industry Association's John Neufer chronicles some of the touch points along the way and explains why government industry partnerships are must-have components of the innovation ecosystem, not just nice-to-have components. Our industry is, is fiercely competitive, um, and, and, and that, that leads to all sorts of great innovation breakthroughs. Competition creates an environment where you're going to be innovative. But for the most basic kinds of pre-competitive research, it's just very hard for our companies to, to collaborate. Uh, first of all, it's, it can be uh, witheringly expensive, but we need to have a place where we can come together as competitors to find these new basic innovations, to, to, to make these new basic innovations. And DARPA has a long history of collaborating with, with our industry in this regard to get new breakthroughs. A DARPA-funded contract in the 90s enabled scientists at leading universities to research the then-new transistor design known as FinFET. FinFET, short for Fin Field Effect Transistor. That refers to a transformative transistor design that enabled manufacturers to add complexity and density to circuits by building transistors vertically up from the otherwise planar geometry of wafers and chips. Without this breakthrough, our industry would have stalled and we would not be where we are today in terms of chip innovation. Then there's something called wide band gap semiconductor materials developed by DOD DARPA in collaboration with industry, helped to rapidly advance GAN technology into an industrial relevant one that is now a part of all major RF radio frequency semiconductor device manufacturers portfolios and is a market where the U.S. industry is dominant. GAN, G-A-N. That stands for gallium nitride, which is a semiconductor like silicon, but in which electrons can be made to move faster and to emit higher frequency and higher power electromagnetic waves. 
These are the sorts of basic physical properties that, for one thing, enable U.S. electronic warfare technology to effectively see farther and jam radar probes more effectively than can adversaries. And, and then there is this gallium arsenide uh, transistor innovation driven by DARPA and industry. In the late 1980s, gallium arsenide transistors enabled handheld phones to establish the critical communication links to cell phone towers. And to this day, most cell phones contain a small piece of that technology to perform this critical function. So in addition to fostering advancements in semiconductor technologies used for national security, the ripple effect from these kinds of research uh, have been felt across a full range of semiconductor applications and will continue to do so, whether it's communications, healthcare, transportation, clean energy, AI, quantum 5G, and on and on. Even though many DARPA-driven advances have made their way into civilian technology, the programs that lead to them are designed to strengthen U.S. defense capabilities. The D in DARPA stands for defense. Jim Libus, a much-decorated chief engineer for advanced electronic strategy at the defense technology firm Lockheed Martin, has contributed to the evolution of electronics in both defense and civilian applications. Prior to his Lockheed work, he spent 26 years beginning in 1981 with IBM. With a background like that, Libus has a privileged perch for discerning the electronics challenges that the civilian and defense sectors share and the challenges that are specific for national security applications. The defense industrial base has unique microelectronics challenges that the commercial sector really does not have, right? The, 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 the two sectors have very different business models. The commercial sector is very market-driven with a large demand driven by products that are you know, ultimately purchased by consumers. Think about laptops and tablets and, and smartphones. The defense sector is very mission-driven, providing national security with systems and platforms operating in harsh environments in every domain, in air, in sea, space, land, and cyber. So this leads to unique challenges and concerns about the performance, the availability, the trustworthiness, and the affordability of the microelectronics our defense systems rely on. In the course of his work, Libus too has had some touch points with DARPA, the latest one involving the Electronics Resurgence Initiative. More than ever, a strong domestic uh, microelectronics industrial base is really critical to national security. And, you know, we, we all know that DARPA has a long history of um, successfully addressing these challenges in the microelectronics area that benefit not just national security, but also the commercial sector. Um, you know, this certainly led to significant advancements during, you know, the first three waves of microelectronics innovation over the last 30 years. But based on the current challenges that we've been facing, um, DARPA's ERI program is really leading the way in addressing those, those challenges. They're both technical and economic. Um, and this is really leading the way into the fourth wave of innovation. So ERI is really advancing the microelectronics innovation that we will need in the future, right? So you think about new microsystems design and microsystem security, new materials and new architectures. And you know the, the real focus here is on systems and applications. It's not just on base technology, not on device scaling. It's about what are the future systems and what are the applications across the whole technology stack. So, you know, ERI programs have really made significant contributions to the electronics needs of the defense industry. And they're certainly leveraging uh, significant commercial investments in advanced microelectronics. So overall, the impact to the defense industrial base has really been significant, right? We continue to transition these capabilities developed under ERI into our programs to address our challenges and to also deliver rapid cutting edge you know, solutions. And what, what really makes this so successful is the public-private partnership model that they have created, right? It, it brings together the commercial sector, the defense industrial base, the university researchers, and of course, you know, the DOD to address all of these challenges. And our researchers are fully engaged. It's in DARPA's DNA to be full in on the programs it currently runs while also looking down the road to identify what's next, Microsystems Technology Office Director Mark Rosker. We are recognizing that ERI ends uh, about the 22 timeframe. 
And we would like to continue to develop cutting edge ideas, uh, new ideas beyond that point. So the effort that we're proposing and developing, we're, we call ERI 2.0. And uh, it really leads in a couple of different directions. We're asking ourselves from a research standpoint, what are the areas that we're not doing now that are emerging, maybe have emerged in the last three or four years as uh, critical areas that we should focus on? One of those is thinking about new ways of manufacturing of electronics. And what ultimately uh, I think we're interested in thinking about is in these dense three-dimensional uh, circuits that we think will be the center of the fourth wave of electronics, how do you build them? Rosker thinks of the Moore's Law advances in semiconductor manufacturing as having unfolded in three waves with a fourth one on its way. The first wave, called geometric scaling, was all about making transistors ever smaller and packing them ever more densely. That lasted until the late 1980s. That's when the second wave of scaling got underway. That one focused on overcoming the challenges of interconnecting all of these individual microscopic devices into ever more capable circuitry and processors. By the early years of the new millennium, the individual flat or planar transistors on chips were getting vastly small, down to tens of atoms across. This meant that the transistors were reaching the edge of minuteness beyond which they could no longer reliably behave as gates that allow or block electronic flow. In the context of digital processing, this meant a transistor of these minute sizes could suddenly shift from representing a zero to a one. That is where the third wave of scaling comes in, this one marked by those three-dimensional finfets. Now comes that fourth wave, the one that ERI is all about. One thing is for sure, says Rosker, this will not be business as usual when it comes to manufacturing. They're going to be built in entirely different ways. And they may not be manufactured quite as much as assembled. So how do you compose them? How do you assemble them? And how do you interconnect them? So a lot of really interesting ideas have been developed recently in things like 3D printing and uh, additive manufacture. And those things may lead us towards building electronics and electronic systems in entirely different ways from what we're doing now. Certainly different, but also may, having maybe much higher capabilities when viewed as in terms of things like interconnect volumes. Uh, volume densities. So that's one area. A second area that I think has captured our attention as of late is thinking more about uh, electronics that live sort of in niche environments. We usually think of these as harsh environments. The most obvious one is space. The electronics that is produced for your cell phone, for example, doesn't do very well in a space environment. Uh, space applications are becoming more and more proliferated for both commercial and uh, government needs, this has become more and more of an issue. But it's not just radiation and space, it's also things like high temperature. So your, again, electronics generally does not operate above 150 degrees, just point at one number, but there are many applications that we care about that would benefit from electronics that was much more robust. So those are areas that at least provide examples of the kinds of things that we would like to be looking at in ERI 2.0. There's an entire other dimension that I wanted to, to mention as well, and that is prototyping uh, and really coming up with new ways in which we can move very rapidly from invention to production. And I think it goes very well with this theme of 3D heterogeneous integration, because building the infrastructure, uh, building the circuits is increasingly difficult. So if you're coming, as we're coming up with m new manufacturing processes, we would like to be able to exploit those manufacturing processes to build uh, systems quickly and uh, in ways that are much more accessible than perhaps uh, is possible today. Taking on that responsibility of setting up an infrastructure uh, to do that is something we're giving a very hard look at right now. John Newfer of the Semiconductor Industry Association, for one, is optimistic that even if Moore's Law peters out, the kind of R&D that ERI is supporting 
will keep advances going apace. And while, you know, Moore's Law, in some regards, may be running its course, I'm confident that through new, you know, breakthroughs, new architectures, new design, new materials, we'll be able to continue to leap forward. And, and that's why ERI is so important, because it's focused on all these new potential breakthroughs when it comes to architecture, design, and materials. We all know firsthand how much microelectronic technology has changed the world over the last 60 years. It has transformed home life, work life, social life, how we do business, how we play, how we fight wars. The current global shortages in the electronics supply chain is showcasing the centrality of this technology to our lives. DARPA has co-evolved with microelectronics technology with its Electronics Resurgence Initiative and its follow-on ERI 2.0. DARPA's goal is nothing less than to take the microelectronics miracle into a new and more expansive era. Thanks, listeners, for sharing this time with me. I hope you join us again for the next Voices from DARPA. Thanks also to Tom Shortridge for his partnership in producing this program. For more information about the Electronics Resurgence Initiative, the agency's Microsystems Technology Office, as well as all of DARPA's other projects, visit DARPA.mil. And for links that enable you to download this podcast, go to the Voices from DARPA page on DARPA's website. 